Welcome back to the Earth-like planet of Noterra. At the end of the last episode, the planet was left in a bleak state. Photosynthetic microbes had produced so much oxygen that the warm blanket of methane which had surrounded the planet had completely dissolved. The temperature plummeted, and the entire planet was encased in an uninterrupted global glacier. This was a period called the Foremic Glaciation, which dominated the beginning of the new Bioterian Eon. 99% of all life before the glaciation had gone completely extinct. The only refugia for ancient life were either deep in the oceans, where volcanic vents provided warmth and nutrients, or at volcanic hot springs, which formed small warm lakes on the surface. This global ice age would last for a staggering 400 million years. Occasionally, the buildup of volcanic gases would begin to thaw away an equatorial band of ocean, which would be greedily recolonized by photosynthesizers and repeating the cycle anew. But no midnight lasts forever. In the 400 million years of the Forema glaciation, Noterra's home star was beginning to heat up. It became hot enough that Noterra could feasibly support an oxygen atmosphere without turning into a desolate icy waste. All that was needed now was a catalyst to start the great melting of the ice. After hundreds of millions of years of ice and snow, an asteroid 15 kilometers in diameter impacted near the planet's equator. Hundreds of kilometers of ice were instantly vaporized, and trapped volcanic gases flooded into the atmosphere. Global temperatures rose quickly, and the planet's once oppressive glaciers melted away in only a few hundred years under a hazy yellow sky. And when the dust settled, Noterra's oceans were flooded with nutrients from the land. This reborn world was ready to witness the evolution of something completely new that would change the course of life forever. This was a zygophage, an ancient and fearsome lineage of microbial predator. It was a kind of Zenarian cell distinguished by its two-layered structure. This inner section is called the endozoic compartment and contains the genetic material and most of the cellular machinery. This outer section is called the parazoic compartment and mainly contains the digestive enzymes. In this way, you can think of the parazoic compartment almost like a zygophage's stomach. It was unique among Noterra's life forms for its ability to carefully manipulate its cell membrane and envelop large chunks of organic matter. The pili at the front of the zygophage were used for puncturing the cell wall of prey and causing it to burst. The contents of the prey's cytoplasm would then be enveloped by the hunter, which would store them for its own use in an internal kleptoplastic vesicle. Kleptoplasty on Earth usually refers to the theft of photosynthetic organelles, like how leaf slugs steal chloroplasts from the algae they eat in order to gain photosynthetic abilities. Here, we use the word in a more general sense to refer to any organism stealing another organism's metabolic capabilities. Let's take a closer look at how the zygophages accomplished this. Protein channels embedded in the parazoic membrane were responsible for shuffling waste out of the zygophages' periplasm and for importing useful nutrients from the outside. These channels remained active even in the newly created vesicle. So long as they kept pumping, the membrane of the kleptoplastic vesicle would be maintained and repaired, and as soon as they stopped, digestive enzymes would begin to break it down along with its contents. This allowed the zygophage to distinguish between food and metabolically useful pockets that were worth more than the mere calories contained within them. In one zygophage lineage, a small genetic mutation caused the perforating pili to become almost useless. But the mutant thrived regardless, making up for its defect by scavenging and, wherever possible, by swallowing entire cells. Completely incidentally, this microbe lineage had taken the first step towards becoming a categorically more complex life form. Over time, its descendants became more and more specialized for this feeding style called phagocytosis. Enveloping entire cells provided a number of benefits. Prey that was metabolically useful would remain alive for much longer than its mere proteins would have lasted. On the other hand, Prey that couldn't provide a benefit through kleptoplasty could be digested without any food diffusing into the surrounding water. 
one particular prey species which coexisted in the same environment as these peculiar zygophages was Spiramentus exilis. It specialized in breaking down sugars and lactic acid using oxygen, the latter being the waste product of zygophages' anaerobic metabolism that would tend to build up in the zygophages' periplasm and be energetically expensive to excrete. Over time, selection favored a lineage of Spiramentus exilis that adopted a unique strategy. They would purposefully attract zygophages with the intention of being engulfed. To prevent themselves from being digested, they would then strategically leak UTP, the primary chemical store of energy on Noterra, into the zygophages' periplasm. The two species had stumbled upon a kind of crude symbiosis. Zygophages exported their excess lactic acid and received energy in return. For Spiramentus, this arrangement also provided access to a consistent, plentiful source of food and stable environment. Only one small problem plagued this mutualistic relationship. Spiramentus could not reproduce while inside the zygophage. The membrane that the zygophage maintained for its prey was often simply not large enough to contain two daughter cells and would be at risk of bursting. So after engulfment, Spiramentus would have to play the long game, waiting for its host to die incidentally before reproducing in the open water. This high-risk, high-reward strategy paid off enough to be advantageous, but it wasn't a convenient arrangement for either species. The Spiramentus lineage came up with two solutions to this problem. One lineage, Spiramentus thanatus, evolved the control release of a kind of poison to kill off its host when it felt ready to reproduce. But this destabilized the relationship between the two species, which had become dependent on each other's survival. As such, this adaptation had the tendency to cause its own demise by devastating host populations. A second lineage, Spiramentus fortis, instead evolved just the right combination of extracellular proteins to mimic those of the host. The result was that the periplasm's digestive enzymes would not break down the Spiramentus cell wall, allowing it to live within its host unscathed and unprotected. This marked a turning point where Spiramentus began to live out its entire life cycle within a zygophage's periplasm, allowing it to drastically reduce its own genetic complexity. Spiramentus no longer needed any genes dedicated to finding food. Many genes for adapting to different environmental conditions could also be lost, and any genes relating to predator avoidance became obsolete. This reduced genome freed up an enormous amount of energy, which the zygophage could use to maintain a larger genetic code of its own. One of the first major systems that this newfound energy was used to power was a complex series of dynamic threads called a cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton's primary purpose was shuffling around Spiramentus symbionts to ensure that daughter cells received an equal number. Along with this increase in complexity, the zygophages could now also undergo an enormous increase in size, which allowed them to hunt larger prey species like photoforms. The increase in size came with challenges, however. One of the most fundamental problems for growth in biology is something called the square cube law. As volume increases in size, the surface area increases at a lower rate than the volume. In our zygophage, this meant that its endozoic membrane-bound protein channels would no longer be sufficient to regulate the periplasm. To compensate, as the zygophages grew, their endozoic membranes began to fold and later reticulate, meaning they became web-like, to increase surface area while keeping volume low. This structure, called a reticulated endoplasm, also served as a useful docking site for symbionts, making UTP export much more efficient. These new, large zygophages, which we will call titanophages, primarily occupied mass predatory niches, scooping up microbial prey in massive numbers. But due to their ability to easily steal metabolisms, they also rapidly diversified into chemotrophic and phototrophic niches. But even the titanophages were diminutive compared to what would succeed them. The next bottleneck that came with a higher metabolism and larger genomes was that mutation rates increased and genetic damage control became much more important. One of the easiest ways to counteract this would be through something called polyploidy. Mentioned briefly in the last episode, 
Polyploidy refers to when a single organism has multiple sets of genes, which are usually near identical. In this arrangement, one set of genes can be used to repair the other, and vice versa, helping to keep mutations in check. Another way to protect genetic integrity is by evolving a physical barrier between the genetic code and the reactive sections of the cell. In our titanophages, this came in the form of a protein sheath that encompassed the genetic code. When genes became physically separated from ribosomes, which are responsible for reading single-stranded genetic code and turning it into proteins, it became possible to do much more editing on these strands before they were transcribed. This allowed a cell to essentially encode more behaviors with fewer genes and represented a leap in complexity. We'll call these wrapped genetic packages nucleodes. Another growing problem was that so far all vesicle formation had originated at the perizoic membrane. This membrane required a certain degree of stability since it faced the outside environment and was unable to keep up with the increased demand for vesicles within the more complex cells. For this reason, our titanophages eventually evolved a third membrane, which resided between the perizoic and endozoic membranes. We'll call this new structure the metaplasmic membrane, and the space between it and the endozoic compartment will be termed the metaplasm. The metazoic membrane's primary function was to serve as raw material for vesicle formation, but it would also represent a useful barrier between the hostile periplasm and the calmer, more hospitable metaplasm, where symbionts could be hosted without excess periplasmic stressors. We'll call these asexual complex cells metaphages. But there was one last hurdle limiting the complexity and evolvability of these metaphages. They were incapable of exchanging genomes between each other, and their multiple membranes had rendered horizontal gene exchange increasingly difficult. This meant that all metaphages were nearly identical clones of their singular parent cell, which hampered genetic diversity. The primary way complex organisms exchange information is through sexual reproduction, which arose in a descendant of the metaphages as well. However, sex is an enormously complex process, and it's highly unlikely that metaphage sexual reproduction would look anything like it does on Earth, especially given how different metaphages are from Earth's eukaryotes. So the metaphage pathway to sexual reproduction took an entirely different route. It may have begun quite incidentally in a species of resilient metaphages which evolved to strengthen the protein sheaths on their nucleodes in times of stress to prevent genetic damage. These hardened, inactive nucleodes will be referred to as nucleocysts. Being merely inert genetic bundles, nucleocysts would have been able to survive even if the surrounding cell died, although they wouldn't be able to rebuild themselves on their own. But if they were swallowed by another zygophage of the same species, they may have been accidentally transported into the endozoic compartment and joined the assemblage of nucleodes within. Pre-existing recombination pathways would then integrate the new genetic material into its new host cell, providing it with potential for useful genetic adaptations. What started as an incidental gene transfer then later became purposeful with the repeated excretion of nucleocysts by cells hoping to proliferate their genetic material. Other cells of their species would then have an incentive to integrate these genetic packages as a good source of useful genetic material. Surface proteins on the nucleocysts would have helped recipients to identify which nucleocysts originated from their own species, minimizing the chances of harmful interspecies breeding. These new sexually reproducing metaphages had such an advantage over their asexual predecessors that they entirely supplanted their ancestors in a matter of a few tens of millions of years. We'll call these organisms criteriotes, and they will mark the evolution of what could be considered an entirely new domain of life. All in all, the transition from zygophage to criteriote took around 200 million years, ending 1.6 billion years ago. But in that time, the planet was also undergoing some profound changes. Since the Cordean Eon, volcanic activity had been steadily decreasing. Volcanoes are a crucial source of geological recycling for organic molecules, including silicon. 
As volcanic activity slowed, fewer silicate rocks were exposed to surface weathering from rain, which meant less silicic acid in the oceans. This alone would have been nothing more than a mild decline, but at around the same time, the early continental plates were shifting in such a way that the planet cooled slightly and became drier as a result. Less rain meant even less silicate weathering, beginning a period called the silicate drought, during which organisms reliant on silicic acid struggled. One clade that suffered particularly large losses were the photoforms, which relied on silicic acid to construct their elaborate cell walls. This opened up an ecological window for the newly evolved criteriotes. On Earth, the development of true endosymbiosis, where a bacterium turns into an organelle, is a chance event that has happened only a couple times in Earth's history. It takes hundreds of millions of years for these relationships to stabilize. The criteriotes, on the other hand, had the right combination of features to constantly exchange and trial new potential symbiotic partners through their periplasmic vesicles. This pipeline will be termed the symbiont uptake system, and it proved to be a particularly handy adaptation in unstable environments where it allowed an organism to quickly adapt its metabolism to new conditions. But it also meant that criteriotes formed true endosymbiotic relationships much more easily than eukaryotes in the same time span. This led to the rapid and often convergent diversification of criteriotes into all sorts of metabolic niches, including phototrophic, anaerobic, and chemotrophic ones, much like the earlier radiation of titanophages. So with the decline of traditional silicozoidian photosynthesizers, phototrophic criteriotes could take their place at the base of the food chain, boosting surface water productivity to even higher levels than under the photoforms. Photoforms would still thrive in upwelling zones where silicic acid from deeper waters would rise to the surface, but their global reign was mostly over. As this ecosystem restructuring went on and life began to fully recover from the early oxygen disaster, the increased productivity and biomass of criteriotic photosynthesizers caused oxygen levels to begin rising again, maintaining the colder and drier conditions which had caused the silica drought in the first place even though the continents had already repositioned in that time. All in all, the silica drought continued in one form or another for over 500 million years, when the planet finally began to warm up again. Increased rainfall from planetary monsoons in this warm period brought silica and other nutrients back into the waters, creating an enormous bloom of photosynthesis around 1.1 billion years ago. But the blessing was a curse in disguise. Blooms of photosynthesizers are inevitably followed by further increases in oxygen, and one billion years ago, this reached a critical turning point. The North and South Polar ice caps began expanding rapidly until they met at the equator, ushering in a second global glaciation brought about in almost the same way as the first. This was the Hadriotic glaciation. Just under a billion years since the early oxygen disaster, the late oxygen disaster had brought the planet's life once again face to face with extinction. Less intense than the first, but nonetheless devastating, the Hadriotic glaciation would see the extinction of 70% of species, including most prokaryotes. In the next episode, we'll see how life continues to adapt to unstable climates, and finally, explore the great diversity of unicellular criteriotes that are the new rulers of Noterra. I will see you all in another hundred million years. <laughs>